Hey, it's Tan Vin, and this is Seattle Eats. If you grew up in Seattle, you probably ate teriyaki chicken. Juicy, charred chicken thigh, glistening with a savory sweet sauce. This dish is a Seattle invention, so it makes sense that there are hundreds of teriyaki joints in Western Washington. It's overwhelming to pick just one. Luckily, we have a friend to help us. Kenji Lopez Out is the author of the James Beard Award winning cookbook, The Food Lab. You might recognize him from his YouTube channel or his work with the New York Times. Kenji is on a quest to eat at every teriyaki spot in Seattle. Today, we'll dive into what makes great teriyaki. And later, I talked to Kenji about one of our favorite restaurants in Colombia. It may move to the Seattle area, and we'll tell you what to expect if it does. But for now, let's head off on the teriyaki quest. Kenji, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tan. And thanks for taking us along with you on your quest to eat all the teriyaki in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. I'm trying to do that. It's a lot of teriyaki. Are you insane? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, uh, it's my job, right? People people do things for the, for work all the time. I just happen to eat teriyaki for work right now. It's, it's a self-assigned job, to be fair, but... <laughs> now, you realize there could be, oh, I don't know, more than 200 teriyakis in the Seattle? If you stay in, in Seattle proper, I think it's actually a little less than 100. Because I think, I think before the pandemic, it was a little over 100. And now I think it's somewhere in the upper 80s. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> and Kenji, you don't seem to realize the borderline, the zoning here, because you've gone to Mercer <laughs> Island and outside the city for teriyaki. I, I have, yeah, I've done a little bit on the east side. I've done some on Mercer Island. You know, sometimes if I'm just passing through and I see a teriyaki joint, I got to stop in and see what it's like, you know. Uh, but my goal is to get to all the ones in Seattle proper. Uh, and I might, I might stray out of there a little bit if I, uh, you know, if I feel like I need to hit more. <laughs> I can tell you, you probably have eaten more teriyaki than most teriyaki lovers in Seattle who's gone for decades because they don't venture out of their neighborhood when it comes to teriyaki. Well, that's the thing about teriyaki. You know, it's I'm a New Yorker, right? So I think of it as, as New York's uh, – pizza is to New York what teriyaki is to Seattle where it's a ubiquitous food. It's all over. It's a very democratic food. It's it's re- relatively inexpensive. It's not necessarily a destination food. There, there's some joints that are that I think are worthy of a trip uh, that are sort of destination teriyaki joints. But just like New York pizza, you, you go to the one that's closest to you and it's good enough, right? That, that's sort of, I think, the idea. I love that you mentioned pizza – and New York, because is this our version of the New York slice? Is teriyaki a Seattle thing? Oh, absolutely. Teriyaki, as we know it, in the, the idea of chicken teriyaki. So chicken teriyaki does exist in Japan, but the way we know it in the U.S. is this sort of like, you know, big pieces of chicken thigh that are grilled, sliced, have a sort of sweet and savory sauce. Um, that is specifically started in Seattle, you know, it was by Toshi, who is now up in Mill Creek. You can still get teriyaki from the guy who created uh, what we know as teriyaki. Um, but uh, it was created in the 70s in Seattle, and Seattle is sort of the epicenter of chicken teriyaki in the U.S. So there's a higher concentration of chicken teriyaki in Seattle than anywhere else, uh, probably in the world, to be honest, um, but certainly of this style of teriyaki, Japanese-American style. That's why you you still see so much, so much of it in Seattle. We can't talk about teriyaki without talking about the godfather of it, the founder, the OG, Toshi. Toshi, yeah. Mm-hmm. You probably know more about the specific history than I do. I know that he was a, a Japanese-American immigrant uh, who uh, you know, took traditional Japanese teriyaki and adapted it for the American palate. Um, and I know, you know it was sometime in the 70s, you, you probably know the details of, of exactly where and when this was. Toshi opened, I believe, around March 1976. It was on Roy Street in Lower Queen Anne. And when I talked to him last year, it was almost like a speakeasy, he said. Not because he's trying to be secretive, but because he didn't have money to put on big signs and so forth. So it was a hard place to find. And what happened was in July 1976, the then restaurant critic, John Hittenberger, reviewed it. This is the Seattle Times critic? Yeah, the Seattle Times critic reviewed it which is groundbreaking at the time and even a little controversial because, quote, you didn't review Oriental places. These Mm -hmm. were the kind of places that people looked at. And the fact that Seattle Times reviewed it kind of raised its profile. Uh And within weeks, he did not understand why there were lines out the door to check out this one dish. Eventually, he franchised the name. And so there were a whole bunch of Toshi's teriyakis. And in fact, many of them still exist. But I know that 
at this stage, none of them are actually associated with Toshi anymore. I think they, they franchised the name and then all of those got got sold off and are, are now all independent independently owned. So you might find places that are called Toshi's Teriyaki and in fact have the same logo, but they're all independently owned now. And and you know, and, and then eventually Toshi went up to Mill Creek uh, and opened the spot that he's currently at, which is now I think the only the only authentic Toshi's Teriyaki in town, right? It is. And it's become sort of like I wouldn't say a tourist attraction, but people actually go to Mill Creek just to try his teriyaki and plus to get a picture taken with him. Yeah, I mean, it's like the mecca for teriyaki nerds, right? Yeah. Isn't this weird, Kenji? Because I feel like, like you mentioned, New York style pizza and Philly cheesesteak mm-hmm. and the Chicago dog. But we don't seem to claim teriyaki as our own, like other city. Right. It's not the same pride. I mean, you leave Seattle, you don't see other states doing, hey, chicken's teriyaki, Seattle style. Yeah. Right? I do think that's interesting, to be honest. Um, and, and in fact, I think many Seattle people who grew up in Seattle don't realize that it's so, such a unique thing to Seattle. And they leave Seattle and they're like, where are all the teriyaki joints? You know, and it's just like you go to New York, there's, you don't you don't have a teriyaki joint every two blocks like you do in Seattle. Yeah, it really is a uniquely Seattle thing. But, you know, maybe maybe we should try and change that. Maybe we should really uh, work on uh, increasing the infamy of Seattle teriyaki. Uh, and, you know, so when you go to New York, maybe we should uh, tell people, hey, like, have you, you, you should check out this this new Seattle style teriyaki. We should encourage chefs to, to really name it Seattle style teriyaki because that, that is what it is. It's not it's not Japanese. It's not from anywhere else in the U.S. It's sort of really a uniquely uh, Seattle thing. Yeah. When you order teriyaki, it's yeah. usually to go, or even if it's not to go, it's usually in a tray. So what goes on this tray? Break it down for me. Yeah. So so your basic teriyaki plate, you're going to get like a clamshell, a plastic clamshell. These days, hopefully a compostable plastic clamshell. You're going to get a bunch of rice. And then ideally, you're going to get um, chicken thighs that have been marinated, grilled, sliced just before they put it in there and then covered with uh, teriyaki sauce. And the teriyaki sauce, you can generally get it uh, sort of standard, which is sort of sweet and savory, or you can get it spicy, which will be generally it's going to be some kind of combination of like a chili sauce mixed with the teriyaki sauce. That's generally how they make their spicy sauces. And then also in that box, you're typically going to have a salad, chopped iceberg, maybe like three or four shreds of carrot, and that's about it. And then a sort of sweet and tangy dressing. Um, it's sort of a mayo, a mayo-based dressing that has some extra sugar. Generally, I also like to order gyoza with mine. Um, and when you order gyoza, it is almost always deep-fried gyoza. The best chicken teriyaki, um, well, ideally, it'll be you're, you're going to a place that's really busy, so there's fresh chicken coming off the grill all the time, so it'll be both fast and fresh. The worst places are the ones that kind of have the chicken pre-sliced sitting in a steam table, and they just kind of scoop it on there, you know, and the chicken all dries out. But ideally, what you want is chicken that's marinated but not over marinated to the point that it tastes kind of like cured or sort of like hammy you know so I want it nice and juicy very flavorful um, and what I'm really looking for is a nice char uh, so both that flavor that smoky flavor a little bit of that sort of bitter burnt flavor from the little t- charred bits but especially good texture I, w- I really want to feel that contrast between the crispy charred bits and the and the juicy center of the chicken Kenji I would say you hit the nail right on the head with the marinade Toshi Mm-hmm. has told me the secret is you have to marinate the chicken thigh. Yeah, I would say 20 years ago, everyone marinated their chicken, mm-hmm. but now teriyaki isn't as popular. So what they do is they don't want marinated. They grill the chicken, and if you want teriyaki, they'll just pour over the teriyaki the sauce. sauce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And that way, what they do is they'll have other items, and they'll like, hey, you want curry chicken? They'll just pour the curry over it. Right, right, right. And right. sour over it. But you're right. There's a big difference. Yeah, you know, because teriyaki, at least as a Japanese concept, it's not just a sauce, right? It's a process, right? It literally translates to like shiny grilled, you know, and the process of, of cooking something teriyaki, uh, you marinate it. And then as it's cooking, you're going to be brushing it with a sauce uh, that gives it this sort of shiny sheen to it. The other thing that a marinade does is it'll actually break down some of the proteins in the chicken so that um, as they cook, they, they, they don't seize up as much. They don't squeeze out as much moisture. Uh, so a properly marinated chicken thigh is going to be juicier. It can be overdone. You know, sometimes you can tell a place as the chicken thighs have been sitting in that marinade maybe for a couple of days. You slice it open and it has the texture almost of like uh, like packaged ham. You know, that's that's the texture of over marinated chicken. I, I don't think that's very good either. But when you hit that sweet spot where it has sort of a natural juiciness to it, but it doesn't taste hammy, uh, that that's sort of the ideal chicken teriyaki for me. 
when you go to a teriyaki shop, tell me how you break it down. You just look at the menu and go, hey, I'll get spicy today or I'll get sweet. I'll pick the sides. I try and keep a baseline. So I, I'll always just get the basic teriyaki unless I'm repeating a place where, where I want to try some other stuff. So like I've been to Rainier Teriyaki a bunch of times and sometimes I'll get other dishes. But I want to compare apples to apples. You know, so I'll always just get a basic teriyaki, the basic teriyaki, whatever salad it comes with uh, by default. And then if there's the option of adding gyoza, I'll add gyoza. And that's sort of my, my yardstick order. And I hate that corn syrupy taste. It's too <laughs> sweet, a lot of these, cloyingly sweet. They can be, yeah. They, they certainly can be, yeah. I, I like to have a sort of balance of sweet and savory. Um, and, and, you know, the, the flavor of a teriyaki sauce can vary. You know, some people will um, will take some sort of, uh, you know, Hawaiian influence and might be, maybe add some pineapple juice in there. Some people will add, uh, you know, ginger or garlic. Some of them just go straight with, uh, you know, soy sauce and sake and mirin, like a more classic Japanese style approach, but it, but it really, yeah, really, it, the sauce does actually vary quite a bit from location to location. What I sometimes like to do is I like to peek around, you know, because these places, they, they all look, most of them look pretty similar. You know, there's a counter, you go up to a kitchen in the back, and then oftentimes uh, they'll have like their wire shelving near the bathrooms where they keep like their tins of soy sauce and stuff like that. And sometimes you can look on those shelves and see, all right, are they, are they making their own teriyaki sauce or are they buying the commercial one? And I would say another good tip, Kenji, is it's run by different ethnic group. Mm -hmm. A lot of Vietnamese who do teriyaki will mm -hmm. also do bun mi's. Uh -huh. And actually, teriyaki bun mi is pretty big. Yes. A Vietnamese shop run teriyaki, and I know three that do this, they use fish sauce to mm. add the unami and that glaze. A lot of Korean restaurant owners will add more garlic mm -hmm. to the component. Mm -hmm. or, or the spiciness will come from gochujang. You know, I think the original shops were run by Japanese American, uh, you know, Japanese immigrants. Um, but these days, you you find a mix across a lot of the East Asian cultures. So you'll you'll find Chinese run teriyaki shops. You'll find Japanese run teriyaki shops. Uh, Vietnamese and Korean uh, in Seattle. I think those are the big four. And and generally, the the secondary items on the menu are what's going to give you the hint as to what uh, as to as to who's running that shop. So a, a, a Vietnamese shop might serve uh, banh mi and pho. A Korean shop might might serve uh, bibimbap, or they might serve uh, galbi or something like that. And a, and a Chinese shop might serve like lo mein or General Tso's chicken or something like that. So I, I always find that really interesting that this one sort of flagship dish, you know, ha has helped many different immigrant communities start businesses that are you know that are successful. Yeah, and it's still true today. Mm -hmm. A lot of Vietnamese restaurants teriyaki is on the menu. Yep, it might not be in the name, but it is on the menu. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But still, the basic concept of the teriyaki sauce. I think it's easier than people realize. How do you make a teriyaki sauce? The very basic one, the most classic, sort of simplest Japanese-style teriyaki sauce, you would take uh, soy sauce, sake, um, and then mirin, which is like a sweet rice wine. And the mirin is what gives it that gla you know, that glazy shininess. Um, and you basically just take those three ingredients uh, and cook them down until it until it reduces to sort of a syrupy glaze. You can you know you can add other ingredients in there. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll I'll throw like the uh, the ends of some carrots if I have some like onion scraps or some scallions, uh, maybe a couple slices of ginger and some garlic, um, maybe some mushroom scraps. I'll throw it all in there. So in the same way that I'm like fortifying a stock, um, I would add those ingredients in there. I might even add like a piece of kombu sea kelp to give it some more of that umami depth. So Japanese style sauce tends to be thinner than what you would expect um, in a more American style teriyaki glaze. So you know most American style teriyaki glazes will have will be thickened with cornstarch so that they get a little bit thicker and a little bit sort of shinier. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to do that, you would take a cornstarch slurry um, and add it to that sauce as it's, as it's reducing. Some people, you know, especially the commercial sauces are going to have things like corn syrup in there to help thicken them. Um, and, you know, corn syrup does also give a nice glaze to it. But, but like you said, I think the corn syrup adds... Um, yeah, that's cloying this without adding, without really adding any flavor. So I tend to, have, I mean, personally, I don't use it at home. Although, yeah, I think there are shops that use it and it, and it tastes just fine. You know? oh, oh, I would say a lot use yeah. it. Yeah. And a lot uh -huh. use cornstarch. Mm -hmm. A lot of cornstarch. Yeah. So tell me some of the ones that you like, some of the teriyaki shops that you like, that you've had. Yeah, okay. So my go-to is uh, Rainier Teriyaki. It's on Rainier Ave down towards Columbia City. Excellent, excellent place. They really nail, nail that uh, that char and that juiciness. Uh, in West Seattle, Grillbird, which is a um, you and I went there, you know, yeah. like a few years ago. Um, it's a more sort of modern Hawaiian influenced take on teriyaki. They're a little bit fancier looking than the other places, and and their sides are more interesting. Because well, their sides are interesting because they are typical sort of a Hawaiian box lunch sides. So things like macaroni salad, things like that. To be honest, it is one of those things where. Most of the time, it's not worth traveling out of your neighborhood for, you know? It's like you, you don't have to hop in the car to get teriyaki. You just walk down the street, right? Like, that's that's the point of teriyaki, I think. Yeah. I, I don't think there's, a, there's any teriyaki where I'm like, oh, I need to go to Bellevue for this one teriyaki style that has more fish sauce <laughs> on it or something like that. You're yeah, right. Well, yeah. 
and I would say Grillbird, and we both met at Grillbird mm-hmm. first time. I think their sides are too fancy for a teriyaki. <laughs> yeah, joint, yeah, it is. Right? It, it definitely is. A, it's it's not your typical teriyaki experience for sure. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a different experience. I would say they have the best sides of all the teriyaki places I've been to. Because I mean, there, there's something about that uh, that chopped iceberg salad for me that I that I really enjoy. You know, just the, the simplicity and and I feel like you know that that iceberg, the crunchiness and sort of the wateriness of iceberg. It's kind of like a, a palate cleanser between bites of teriyaki. You know, I, and uh, no, I, you know, I think there is something to say for for that simple um, iceberg side. But now, I don't understand this dressing that goes on the salad because mm-hmm. I never see this anywhere except teriyaki mm-hmm. dish. So tell me about this dressing that goes on the salad. It's basically uh, like a thin mayonnaise that's sweetened. If you're in England, you can get like salad cream, you know, which is sort of like a thinned out mayonnaise. Um, but but this stuff is a little bit sweeter. You know, it, it, it Japanese palates tend to run very sweet. If you go to Japan, like there's a lot of sweet food, and if you and, and especially in Japan, if you buy if you if you go to say um, a Chinese restaurant in Japan, uh, the, the the dishes tend to be even sweeter than Chinese American food. You know, we, we talk about how cloyingly sweet something like General Tso's chicken or like walnut shrimp are. You know, these Chinese American dishes um, that are really sweet in Japan. Like Chinese food tends to be even sweeter, and so the the dressing is just uh, yeah, may- like mayonnaise with corn syrup or mayonnaise with sugar. Sometimes there's other ingredients. In there as well, you know. So I think the the places that really want to step up their salads, they'll they'll add some other ingredients in there. So some sometimes you might find uh, there might be some miso flavor in there, there might be some sesame flavor in there. Um, but you know, but it, it it really is sort of that, that as simple as like a kind of tangy mayonnaise with 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 extra sugar added to it. The dumplings. How do you feel about the dumplings? Virtually every teriyaki shop is going to be using frozen dumplings. Uh, they're going to take frozen dumplings and drop them into the fryer. The only difference you're really going to find is sort of the quality of the frozen dumpling that they're using because sometimes you can tell you know, some some frozen dumplings are better than others. So some of them are just going to be really dry. Sometimes the, the skins are freezer burned and so they come out really tough. But really it's going to be the quality of the frozen dumpling and then how well they fry it. You know, um, and, you know, and, and the idea of fried, of fried dumplings, fried gyoza, it's not uncommon in Japan. Me and my two sisters, we would sit around like about once a month, maybe every other month, and we'd help my mom fold dumplings. She'd put us in front of the TV and we'd just fold dumplings, you know, and then we'd have them in the freezer. At dinner time, we would eat some of them uh, done sort of pot sticker style, you know, so uh, crispy on the bottom and steamed on top. Uh, but my mom would always take, you know, a handful of them, maybe a dozen of them, deep fry them in the wok. Um, and then pa- pack them into our, our, our bento the next day, our lunchbox the next day. Um, and so deep fried dumplings um, is actually quite common in Japan. And, and typically it's used as like eaten cold the next day or eaten, eaten at room temperature inside a bento. But, you know, what it is, is, what I like about it is that when you deep fry dumpling skins, gyoza skins, they puff up, they get this sort of like egg roll wrapper texture to them. You get lots Blister. of these kind of little micro blisters, you know. Um, and then that makes them really good at absorbing sauce. Like a steamed dumpling, the sauce kind of runs off uh, and it has it's a very different eating experience whereas a, whereas a deep fried dumpling when you dip it in the sauce it, all, it absorbs it and you get this kind of crispy soggy texture which is to I think an American palate sounds strange because when we get our foods crispy we like to keep them crispy but in, in many other other cultures like in, in Japanese culture in Mexican culture a dish like chilaquiles you know something like that there's a lot of Chinese dishes say like um Puff chicken feet, you know, they they get them really nice and puffy and crispy, and then they douse them in sauce and they braise them until the the idea of like taking a something that's been fried until puffy and then soaking it in a in a sauce so that it absorbs those flavors um, is sort of a prized technique. Um, so I, so in that sense, I I actually kind of like the texture and the sauce absorbing flavor of uh, of a deep fried dumpling. I would say that I think teriyaki is the best value Mm -hmm. in Seattle still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No one has ever eaten an entire teriyaki plate and say, I'm still hungry. No one. (laughs) Anytime you say nobody, anytime you make absolute statements like that, you're going to find someone to prove you wrong. (laughs) You're right. You're right. There's always someone out there challenging. Yep. (laughs) Is there a method that does madness or do you just drive around and go, oh, there's a teriyaki shop? I have a map. I think if you go on Google Maps and you search for like Kenji's Seattle Teriyaki Tour, um, I have a public map that'll pop up that shows you uh, the teriyaki joints I've been to, as well as a uh, links to my you know reviews on Instagram or YouTube about them. But no, I you know I, I keep a running map, and and basically yeah, if I get to a new neighborhood, I'll search around for teriyaki and and double check if it's if it's been you know because at this point sometimes I don't even remember all twenty five you know all the ones I've been to, so I want to make sure I don't repeat them. Uh, but yeah, you know I, if I go to a new neighborhood, I'll just say okay, where's the where's the teriyaki joint around here, and I'll I'll just find it and I'll go. At some point, you know, as I get towards the end, I'm sure I'll have to. 
to start actually seeking it out. You know, it, it, to me, it feels like I'm playing um, like a video game, like I'm playing like like uh, Zelda, you know, where at the beginning you just kind of wander around and see what you can see. But then as you get to the end, if you want 100 percent it, you got to you got to be really methodical about it and seek out those hidden corners and like search every search every cave and dungeon until you find all the secrets. Um, so at some point, I think I'll get to there. I'll be peeking into manholes for hidden teriyaki joints. So like <laughs> You know, I remember when we first had teriyaki together mm-hmm. in West Seattle. Mm-hmm. You said one of the benefits is you get to see the city. It gives you an excuse to check out other parts of the town. Which yeah, is going yeah, to yeah. Teriyaki. yeah, no, I, I love that, that, you know, because teriyaki is so ubiquitous and every neighborhood has a teriyaki joint, just by virtue of the fact that I want to get every get to every teriyaki joint, I'm going to end up visiting every corner of the city, which is which I think is a really fun way to discover a city. How many do you think there are left? Well, I've been to 25. So if I'm going to the ones just in Seattle, I think there's about 60 left, you know, 60 to 70 left. And if I want and then if I want to stray out, you know, to the east side, if I want to go north, south, you know, which you have, it can go it can go on and on and on. You know, like I, I'll never finish. Have you been to Mill Creek, the original? <laughs> no, got... I haven't. You know, that that's I have not been up to Mill Creek yet. That's Yeah, I want I want to make a special trip out of that. So I've been kind of holding it off, although, you know, I, I, I should probably do it before Toshi decides to retire. You know, Yeah, it could happen anytime could, soon. Yeah, I mean, he he's keeps a, talking about it. Yeah, he's 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 in his 70s now is that right i believe so yeah still in good health though Mm -hmm. will we see a teriyaki recipe in your book (laughs) well i mean i am working on a new book uh it's not going to be out for a couple years it's kind of another real big book um that is uh designed to teach you how to cook and how to make recipes your own, but how to free yourself from recipes and, and turn dishes into your own food. There probably will be uh, some, some work on teriyaki in there. You know, I'm, I'm going to be relaunching my website, KenjiLopezAlt.com, um, as well as starting to produce a new video series on YouTube. And uh, I'm sure I will visit teriyaki uh, when I do that. Um, and when I do, I think what I want to do is, you know, really talk about all the different styles of teriyaki that I've experienced in Seattle, really pay homage to the immigrant communities that have brought the dish over and have adapted it. Because there's a real real range of what teriyaki has become, um, and, and which I find really fascinating. So even when you say, like, oh, I'm going to make teriyaki at home, like, okay, well, like, what kind of teriyaki? Because it's, 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 you know, it's not just a single dish anymore. It's, it's kind of this range of dishes. Um, so, uh, yeah, at some point, I think I will have my own personal recipe out there that, um, you know, draws from elements of everything I've been tasting around Seattle. I have this dream of having a... Um, street festival, a teriyaki festival where oh. we get some of the best teriyaki joints, close down the block for uh, for a couple days and just have a street festival with live music and 20 different teriyaki joints all all serving their style of teriyaki and whatever the their specialty is. Um, I think it'd be fun and I think oh, it'd be, be a great. real real good celebration of um, you know one of Seattle's indigenous foods, you know one of Seattle's native foods. That's it for our teriyaki chat with Kenji. But he's sticking around in a minute. We'll talk about our experiences traveling and eating far from Seattle in the cities of Columbia. And we'll tell you about one of Kenji's favorite Colombian restaurants that might be moving here. Be back in a moment. I know we've been focused on teriyaki, but Kenji, I just got back from Colombia. Mm-hmm. We exchanged texts because I want to tell you about my favorite restaurant that I went to. It's Prudencia. We both love that place. I got a little scoop for you, Kenji. I don't okay. know if you know this. One, do you know the chef went Mario. to UW? Yeah, so Mar- yeah, Mario is a, is a Colombian, but he spent a lot of time in the U.S. His wife is from, is from Texas. Uh, he went to UW. He spends time between the U.S. and Colombia, but that restaurant, I think, is fantastic. It's, it's not really traditional Colombian food in any sense, but you know, his concept is that everything in there is live fire. So they have a wood fired oven, they have a live fire grill. He built these custom hearths that he calls them Hestia, you know, the goddess of the hearth. I saw him using one of those at the restaurant there uh, the last time I was in Colombia and I loved it so much that I asked him if I could buy them. And he says he says he, you know, he manufactures them for the restaurant, um, but he sold me one of them and I brought it back uh, on the plane in a bunch of giant boxes. So I actually have one of those on my roof here in, in Seattle. That's a crazy contraption. It's yeah. huge. But before we even get to that, he has checked out spots in Orcas Island and Lopez Island because Ooh. he is seriously considering moving to San Juan Island next year. Wow. Well, that, that would be exciting. I mean, because his food is fantastic. To see what he could do with sort of native Pacific Northwest ingredients, you know, because he, he's really all about 
well, live fire and and local ingredients. Um, and in Colombia, that's a lot of that's a lot of meat and corn and potatoes. But to see what he'll do, uh, you know, with the with the seafood and the and the mushrooms and all the all the bounty of the Pacific Northwest, I think would be really exciting. That's really exciting news. Yeah, yeah. And and we should break this down because I know you love the place. I thought that was one of the best meals I had in Colombia. Oh yeah. And so when I talked to him, he says that his idea, if he were to open in San Juan Islands, it would be one service a night. Thursday through Saturday, Mm -hmm. and brunch Sunday. And he would do the same thing as he does right now. He'll build his own smoker, Mm -hmm. all his own contraption, Mm -hmm. a lot of smoked meat. The meal is like eight courses. Mm -hmm. This is really weird. My first two courses were in the main dining room. And then for the third course... He moves you outside. He moves you outside to the courtyard garden, where you have two more courses... And that's where he grows his herbs, his flowers, his veggies, and you have two courses. And that's where his his daughter has a has a little treehouse there also. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. My kids were playing in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And then after you have two courses out in the garden, they move you back into the dining room for the main course, the protein. Mm-hmm. And the protein is outstanding. It's in a wood fired oven. And it's just clean flavor, pork belly, fish, whatever. That's just great. Yeah, it's all. I mean, it's all very, very simple food that's really designed to accentuate the ingredient uh, and the fire. Those are the two main, main main elements of his food. Is that he really wants to accentuate the main ingredient and the fire. And so it's it's none of it's very complicated, but it's all very precise and all very thoughtful. Um, his, yeah, his food is amazing. I yeah, think. and his bread is stunning. Yes, they make excellent bread there too. Yeah. I can tell you now, people in San Juan Islands and even here in Seattle, you are going to want to check out this restaurant if he does open, and there's a good chance he might. Well, I will have to email him and, and figure this out because right? <laughs> I'll, I'll be the I'll be there opening night if he does it. <laughs> yeah, and okay, we have to talk about this contraption. The owner, Chef Mario, who went to UW, he is a Renaissance. He built all his equipment, mm-hmm. and the contraption that you brought. I've seen it because mm-hmm. he told me, mm-hmm. and it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So first, explain this contraption that you brought from the restaurant and then explain how you got it home he calls it the hestia uh, which is the, you know the goddess of the the greek goddess of the hearth is hestia um, and it's essentially a, a cast iron hearth so it's like a a big bowl a big cast iron bowl uh, i would where, call it a giant a giant bowl. cast iron bowl yeah may, i don't know what it is maybe 40 inches across something like that um and you put wood in there or coal whatever whatever your fire source is uh, you build a big fire underneath um and then there are three legs and then uh, and, and then on each side of the bowl there's these metal rods you know poles that stick up and clamped onto those poles is a series of grates that can rotate on and off. You can rotate them completely off the fi- off of the fire so that you're getting no heat, and then with a with a really simple movement, you can rotate it over the fire so that you're getting heat, and then you can also slide them up and down so that they are closer or further away from the fire. Um, you can put a regular grilling grate in there, but you could also put like a, a flat cast iron pan in there, like a paella pan or uh, something to, to say sear burgers or steak. You can fit a wok into there. Yeah, I find it a lot of fun to use. You know, it's, it's very, very heavy, and it takes a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. I wish people could see your expression, expression <laughs> on your face now. Like, can't you just geek you know, out? What's and funny, it's like Santa Claus. Er, er, earlier Christmas. this summer, I had a little party on my roof deck, you know, where I invited chefs. And, you know, so I had um, Kevin Smith from, um, you know, the English Beast butcher from Cleaver. Beast and Cleaver. He brought a bunch of meat over, Kempeng from uh, Oxburger and from Taurus Ox. Some folks from Chef Steps were there. And so, they, yeah, they, they all kind of geeked out over this contraption. And were, you know, so I had this party where there were a bunch of chefs just kind of playing around with this live fire thing and, and grilling meat. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, I think if you're, a, if you're a fire geek, it's a really fun tool to have. Although, although yeah, I, I, had to, I bought it in Colombia and then brought it with me uh, on the plane. You, um, wait, 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 wait. You brought it with you? So you had to ship back. You actually? Uh, I I checked it. I packed it up really carefully and checked it. it was, I had to pay a lot of money because it was really heavy. Oh yeah, uh, heck yeah, yeah. You gotta pay. You gotta pay a lot extra to get it over here. But it was worth it for me. <laughs> wow. When you finish your quest of teriyaki, you need to come back on the show to talk about this. Yeah. Well, you know what we should do? When I'm done with this, what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring you my five favorite teriyakis, and we can uh, we can do a blind tasting and let and uh, you tell me what you think. Oh, I would love that. Kenji, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Tan. That's a wrap. A reminder that we have a list of spots we recommended today in the description of this episode. We'll be back in two weeks. Seattle Eats is a production of the Seattle Times and KOW, part of the NPR network. You can support Seattle Eats by investing in the local newsroom and the specialized beats that make this sort of storytelling possible please consider joining and subscribing at KUOW.org slash eats and seattletimes.com. 
Seattle Eats is produced by Claire McGrain and edited by Jim Gates and Trevor Lenzmeyer. I'm Ton Ben. Catch you next time. <laughs>